you very, very much for being here in the hot sun. We are human beings, and so we are animals, so we are biological, so we belong to nature. But just what a conception of our biology would be, just what a conception of our nature would be, such that we can comprehend ourselves as natural, remains very much an open problem. It remains very much our task. If you look to the ideologies, the theories that are currently dominant in our universities, in departments of neuroscience, ideologies which exert a tremendous cultural prestige at this moment in time, I think you will see that these ideologies are bankrupt. We need a new start on the question of our nature, on the question of human experience. And that's what I want to talk about with you today. I will begin by sharing with you an example. Not an example from academic literature, not an example from cognitive science, but an everyday experience which I suspect many of you will, will have had and will recognize and will appreciate. And it's important to me that you recognize it, that you appreciate it, to see my point. Suppose you go to an art gallery to look at work by an artist. But imagine that the artist is unfamiliar to you. Imagine the work is in a style which is unfamiliar to you. It sometimes happens when you do that that you look around the gallery and you just don't get it. You can't see the work. It all looks the same. Pictures, 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 pictures hanging on the wall. They don't stand out to you as individuals. They don't capture your attention. It's flat. There's no depth. It's uninteresting. You probably have that experience. But I'm interested in what happens if you don't give up, if you don't stop at that point. You look further. You try harder. Maybe the friend who has brought you to the, to the gallery is a great fan of this artist and she calls your attention to qualities of the work that you hadn't noticed. You think about the work in front of you. You ask questions of it. Maybe you learn something about the historical context in which it was made. Sometimes, and again, I hope you will agree with me, sometimes something remarkable happens. Whereas before, everything looked the same, all of a sudden, the works pop out at you as having individual characters. Whereas before, everything was flat. Now things have depth. Whereas before, you were uninterested, now you are interested. You could not see the work. Now you can see the work. Or you saw the work, but now you see it differently. This is a marvelous transformation. How can we understand this transformation? It's, it's a transformation from not seeing to seeing. What kind of transformation is it that allows you to see that which was there all along? One interesting thing about this, this transformation is that in some sense it is subjective. After all, the pictures on the wall, they did not change. So if there was a change, it was a change in you. On the other hand, it is not a merely subjective change. After all, it's not merely that you have new feelings or new beliefs about what is there before you. Now you can see it before you could not. Let us call this transformation understanding. And the suggestion that I want to make is that through inquiry, through looking and actively thinking and asking questions of the world before you, we cultivate in ourselves the skills, the understanding, which only then enables us to bring the world into focus. Now I've given examples to do with art, 
But the point of my talk today is not to talk about art. This is a general fact about perceptual consciousness, a general feature of perception. Namely, that the world is flat and opaque and indistinct and unavailable to us until we acquire, through the cultivation of ourselves, the ability to bring it into focus. And indeed, I might mention as an aside, that very possibly one of the reasons why art is so important to us as it is is that art gives us an opportunity to experience, to relive what is really a basic structural, structural feature of all our perceptual conscious lives. Now I give that example to you and I'm going to come back to it as we go on but I, I say it to sort of help fix some ideas for you. Now, contemporary positive science, neuroscience in particular, has an extremely different way of approaching the question, what is visible, what do we see, what shows up for us. And indeed we can, we can name what is really the, the dominant view in contemporary neuroscience, the projection view. The idea is that the world out there projects into my eyes, stimulates my brain, and gives rise to an experience in me. All the action happens between my eyes and my brain. Now, I think that the projection model is false, and it is fairly easy to demonstrate that it is false. And for that purpose, I brought, I brought two slides that I want to show you. However, I'm very uncertain in this lighting conditions whether you'll be able to see them. So I'm going to try, and I need some audience indication about whether you're seeing them. Now, does everybody see a photograph of a street scene in Paris? No? No? Yes? No. Please raise your hand if you can see it. So in the back you can see it, and in the front you can't see it. Well, the image that you have up there is actually a, a film made by the French-American psychologist Kevin O'Regan. And while the image is up there, it is changing. It is changing very gradually. Is there anybody out there who saw how it changed? I suspect, and I offer my, my humble apologies, that you can't see it in these lighting conditions. The car is now red. But when I first put up the image, the car was blue. And the car changed color from blue to red very gradually. For those of you in the back who are able to see it, see if you can notice that the color is changing slowly from red, from blue to red. Can anybody see it? Yes. The point is, and you'll have to take my word for this, that... You have to take my word for this, that, that if the lighting conditions were optimal and you could see the image perfectly, you wouldn't have noticed the change of color. You would not have noticed the change of color, even though your eyes were focused on the region of change, even though the photoreceptors in your eyes and the color-sensitive part of your visual cortex was stimulated by the chromatic event. The point is, merely stimulating your visual system, merely projecting into your brain is not sufficient for experiencing something. And very interestingly, nor is it even necessary. Can we get 
be in the back now. I want to show something else. It's a form of connection between the computer. Yeah. Okay. If you could see the next image, you would have laughed so hard. You would have had such pleasure in the next image. Um, but suffice it to say, suppose you look at a piece of text written on the wall. The meaning of the text immediately pops out at you. Of course, the meaning of the text is not something that directly stimulates your nervous system. What stimulates your nervous system are marks on the piece of paper. We experience more than projections to the eyes. Or we don't need an example on a screen to illustrate this. Imagine that you have in front of you a tomato, a piece of fruit, and you look at this tomato, and you have a visual experience of the tomato. You have a sense of its presence to you in vision. Now notice, you have a sense of the presence of the back of the tomato as well. Your visual experience is not confined to the surface of things. You have a sense of the presence even of the unseen parts of the things that you see. Or consider the fact that you see me. And you don't merely see a certain form and configuration. You see a man. And you see a, a man with other identity features that you can directly perceive. So here is the point. If we think of what is visible as what projects to the nervous system, then we experience much more visually than is visible. Our visual experience is not confined to the visual world. And so we need a different model, a different paradigm than this idea of mere projection. Mere projection gives us nothing. And here is the suggestion I'd like to make to you. Instead of thinking of what we experience as what projects to the eyes and gives rise to events in the brain, think of experience, visual experience, as what is available to a person from a place. That is, we shift the focus on the projective view. Vision happens in my head, between my eyes and my brain. If we shift and say, vision is a matter not of what happens to me, but of what I can do, of what is available to me, given my situation in the environment, now the subject matter of our inquiry is the person in his or her relationship to the surrounding world. It's a very different way of thinking about what the problem is that we want to understand. And the suggestion I want to make is that what shows up for us is what is available. Now, what determines what is available? What determines what we have access to, visually or in thought or in any other way? Well, to some extent, it's determined by what is there, what there is. I now have visual access to you. You are there. But that's not enough. The foundation, the basis of our ability to achieve access to the world is our skills, is our knowledge, is our techniques, is our ability to reach out and pick things up. So consider the tomato again. I have a sense now of the presence in my experience of the tomato's back. Not because the tomato's back is now open to me, but because I now have access to it. And I now have access to it because all I need to do is walk around and look at it. I can move my eyes, I can move my head, and I can change my relationship to the object. I can dynamically reach out and touch it. Or consider your perceptual awareness of the meaning of the text. of the meaning of the text on the wall. That text is available to you because you can read. 
because you have a whole wealth of background knowledge, of background skills, which you spontaneously and automatically bring to bear in your experience. We achieve our awareness of the world. It doesn't happen to us. And we achieve it through skills. Now this has a remarkable consequence. As we enhance our knowledge, as we enhance our skills, we literally expand the scope of our experience. When you learn a new language, you can think thoughts you could not think before. When we learn our first language, it enables us to think about places like, like planets and ancient history, and we can think about mathematics, or think about our mastery of, of notation that allows us to add huge numbers by writing it down. The, the ability, the participation in the skillful practice of writing enables us to achieve access to ideas that we otherwise could not. So ask the question, what is available to us? There is no one line where we can draw and say, this is available to me and that isn't. Right now, I have a sense, a feeling of the presence of the space behind my head. Because it is there for me because I can do this. And I have a sense of the space around the corner out there. I can't do this, but I can jump down and run over there. So my kind of access to that over there is different from this, but it's a matter of degree, not of time. In this connection, it is very interesting to mention technology. So what is technology? What are tools? methods or techniques for extending what we can do, for extending our skills, and in extending our skills, actually extending our bodies and extending our minds. I feel wealthy right now because I have a bank card in my pocket. I know that I can go to the ATM and take out some money. I don't have the money in my pocket now, but I have access to the money. Thanks to the technological system of the bank machine, the bank automat. Or consider the fact that I have a feeling of the presence in my life here, right now, in Modena, of my mother, even though my mother is in New York, because I can take out my phone and call her. Or I could run to the airport and fly to her. The airport and the institution of air travel and the telephone and everything that it involves creates a space of access, a space of availability that would otherwise not be available to me. It gives me access to that which would otherwise be beyond my reach. And I submit to you this is a genuine increase in the scope of what can be available to us and thus in the scope of our consciousness, in the scope of our experience. There was a very interesting study done a few years ago on Japanese teenagers who text message each other all day long. And in Tokyo, it's a huge city, and the, the students sometimes have to travel an hour to go to school and an hour to go home. And they all live in different neighborhoods. So you and my friend, my friend and I, we might live two hours away from each other. But the whole time on our trains, we check back and forth. And anthropologists looked at the content of these text messages, the content of these SMSs, and they discovered something very interesting. There was no content. They weren't exchanging information. They weren't really communicating. They were simply sending signals to each other and responding to signals. They were simply indicating that they were there, that they were in reach, that they shared a social space, that they were able to share by dint of this technology that they could not share without that technology, they could not share in the same way. Now here's a very interesting thing about technology which, which pertains to the very theme of this philosophy week here in Modena. 
technology is cultural and it is social and it is shared but it is also natural we are technology users by nature we are makers and designers of technology by nature a very interesting way to bring this fact out is by thinking of archaeology we now know that for over one million years our ancestors produced absolutely no technological innovations of any kind that remain in the archaeological record they had very simple stone tools and there's no evidence of any improvement or refinement for over a million years and then about 50,000 years ago maybe 80,000 years ago there is an explosion a revolution in the technological record you now have stone implements a tremendous refinement and specialization your stone tools for this and your stone tools for that and your stone tools for making tools your specialization there is now very good evidence from population genetics that it was exactly at this time about 70,000 years ago that we started to show our clothing it is at this time that the great cave paintings of Spain and it and, and France and southern Africa were made and it is very probable that at this time we began using language so what, what emerges is that we from the behaviorally cognitively modern human appears on the earth at exactly the moment that we develop a range of technological practices that are essential for our way of living language, picture making, dress, dwelling, tools these are basic to our biology and this means that we need a conception of our biology a conception of our nature that encompasses the fact that we don't stop at the skin our tools, our clothes, our relations with other people that make our technological practices possible are all part of our nature any biological theory which only asks the question what is going on in my brain or what is going on with me individually cannot do justice to this basic feature of our human nature the fact that we are designers that we are technological tool users now consider this it's also known that for a good 50,000 years before this technological revolution there were humans alive who were anatomically, physically like us. Their bodies and their brains, as far as we know, were the same as ours. But they had none of the technology. Do you think there was a mutation in their brains that suddenly made them smarter? Well, this is something we can, we can only speculate about. But, but the best theoretical models we have of what happened suggest not that there was a mutation in the brain but rather that there were shifts in social organization populations became denser and the populations are denser if I make an improvement there's more people around me who can learn my improvement and make an improvement on it and teach it to their children innovation becomes possible and if there's denser populations you have the possibility of trade exchange which gives rise to the possibility of, of, of specialization you make this tool and I find you the raw minerals to make it and together we can make more tools of a better quality than we otherwise could if that's right 
then this fundamental species defining revolution, the emergence of these cognitive technologies in our lives, depended not on an event in our brains, but on a reorganization of the way we live with each other. And there are many examples of that. Most of us drink milk and eat cheese, but 5,000 years ago, almost all human beings were lactose intolerant. But we developed the domestication of animals, and milk became a cheap food source, and so then we had a mutation so that we could digest it. Culture and technology came first. Our nervous system followed. Our genetic system followed. Okay. Now, I'd like now to, to mention uh, a writer by the name of Francis Crick. He's a great scientist and Nobel Prize winning biologist. You may know that he was one of the co-discoverers of the structure of the DNA molecule. He spent the last years of his life, 20, 30 years of his life, researching into the neuroscience of consciousness, and he was really one of the founders of the contemporary study of the neuroscience of human experience. And he wrote a book in the 90s in which he said the following, you, your personality, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, your identity are nothing but the action of brain cells and their associated molecules. You are your brain. And he added, with a rhetorical flourish, that this idea is so foreign to the way of thinking of most people alive today that it can truly be called astonishing. And she titled his book, The Astonishing Hypothesis. And the astonishing hypothesis is the hypothesis that you are your brain. Now, the idea I would like now to share with you is this. The only genuinely astonishing thing about Crick's hypothesis is how astonishing it is not. The idea that there is something inside of you and that this thing inside of you thinks and feels and decides and is the thing you are, this is a very old idea. This was the great idea of the philosopher René Descartes. And this is an idea that is familiar to us because it comes down to us in our religious traditions. What I want to impress on you is this. Descartes, he believes that this thing inside of you that thinks and feels and decides and is the thing that you are could not be your body. It could not be a part of your body. Why? Because Descartes could not imagine how mere brain material could think, could feel, could decide. How could meat do that? So Descartes said it must be spiritual. It must be immaterial. It must be the soul. Now, the contemporary neuroscientists say, no, it's the brain. The brain is the thing inside of you that thinks and feels and decides. But what I want to impress on you, and by the way, the claim I'm about to make now is not 
controversial is that we do not have any working model of how the action of the brain produces consciousness. In fact, if there's one thesis that everybody working in the field agrees on, it's that you don't really even have a sketch of what a theory of the brain basis of consciousness looks like. Philosophers and scientists sometimes call this the explanatory gap. There is a gap between the brain and the phenomena that we want to explain in terms of the brain. And no neuroscientist currently knows how to bridge that gap. In fact, I would go further and say, however shocking this may sound, that we do not have a better understanding how the brain makes consciousness than how Descartes' immaterial soul makes consciousness. So Crick's conviction that you are your brain is actually an article of faith. It is an assumption. And it may turn out, as I hope to convince you, that it is actually an assumption which limits us in our ability to frame adequate explanations of the phenomena that do interest us. Now, Crick also famously published an article in the journal Nature, which is the world's leading journal of experimental science, in which he said, and this is a, a quote, no longer need scientists sit idly by listening to the tedious debate of philosophers. The problem of consciousness is now a problem for natural science. And, and of course, I applaud this sentiment of, of Crick. It is a problem for natural science. That is, at least I am here as a friend of science and of the project, as I said at the outset, of trying to frame a conception of ourselves as natural, as part of the biological world. But as I hope I've convinced you, the idea that Crick has somehow, or his colleagues, has somehow transcended philosophy and moved beyond it into the realm of certain knowledge, I'm sorry, but that is a fantasy. Crick simply takes a particular philosophical view for granted. And he takes it so much for granted that he doesn't even notice that his whole project is really the expression of a Cartesian philosophy, according to which all that matters is what's going on inside your head. Here is the hypothesis I want to propose and share with you, and which in my book, Out of Our Heads, which is published in Italian as well, I argue for. This is the idea. And in fact, I think this is a truly astonishing hypothesis. Instead of thinking, I'll say it like this, Consciousness is not something that happens in our head, not because it happens in the soul. That's a false opposition. Consciousness is not the sort of thing that happens. It is the sort of thing that we achieve. It is the sort of thing that we do. And like everything else that we do, or that we achieve, it depends on our full embodiment, on our environmental situation, and in particular, on our social environmental situation. Neuroscience of consciousness has been looking for consciousness in the wrong place. Looking for consciousness in the brain is like looking for the value of the euro in the piece of paper. Take the best electron microscope you can find and put your euro in it. It's not 
going to help you find the value. That's not the kind of thing that value is. Would you give a different metaphor? Looking for a dance in the musculature of the dancer. That's not where the dance is. The dance is a dynamic exchange between the dancer and the music and his or her partner. And consciousness is like a dance. It is enacted by us with the world in interaction with the world. And my suggestion is, and this by the way is an hypothesis, and I may be wrong. The suggestion I make is this, if we expand the domain in terms of which we try to explain human experience to include more than just what is going on in the head, but to include the body and the world and technology and social relationships and the dynamic exchange between those, we can explain what has hitherto eluded us. Now, there's a few more ideas I want to share with you before I stop. I'm going to confine myself to two main points. I want to shift and mention a fascinating philosophical puzzle, which is the puzzle, how do we know other minds? I look at you and I experience you as a conscious being with a point of view and experience all of your own. Now here are two very interesting facts. From a certain point of view, a certain rational point of view, it can seem as if our belief our conviction in the presence of other conscious beings has no justification. After all, I never have your experience. All I see is your body. All I see is your behavior. How can I be justified in believing that your behavior is the expression of a consciousness? It might seem that at best I have to make an inference, and I may be wrong. And this is something which science fiction literature has concerned itself with. And this is also something which confronts us in real life when we experience massive brain injury, and a person is in a persistent vegetative state. Sometimes we ask ourselves the question, is my daughter still there? Or is it just the shell of her body that is there? So it's not merely a philosophical question, it's also a moral and ethical question. But the point is, from a certain point of view, it can seem that reason can never help us bridge that space between what we see and what we know. So that's the first point. It seems as if our confidence that others have consciousness is unfounded rationally. Now here's the second point. The second point is, you have to be insane to doubt that your wife or your brother or your child is, mere, is a mere body without, an, without feeling, without ideas, without consciousness. That is, however, however we may think the, the epistemic commitment that we have to the minds of others is rationally unfounded, we cannot even for one minute take that seriously in our lives. And I think that what that teaches us is something very profound, which is that our commitment to each other as persons like ourselves is not grounded on reason. It is not grounded on argument. It is not grounded on inference. In fact, it is the very presupposition of our own experience of ourselves. And you can begin to appreciate this if you remind yourself of our first relationships. Think of the baby in the arm of the mother. Think of 
the relationship of blessed feeding. Humans are mammals, and like all mammals, we suckle our young at the breast. There's one interesting difference between humans and all other mammals. Humans are the only mammal who will stop suckling. The human baby will stop suckling before it is full, before it is satisfied. And it turns out that human mothers everywhere in the world, and by the way, fathers too, if or anybody with a bottle, it doesn't depend on the breast, it could be the bottle. Caretakers everywhere in the world spontaneously respond to the baby's interruption the same way. They jiggle the baby and invite the baby to begin suckling again. So something very remarkable happens. Baby suckles. Baby falls asleep. Mama jiggles baby. Baby wakes up and starts suckling again. Baby starts looking around, gets distracted. Mama jiggles baby. Baby comes back. You get an exchange with a very distinct temporal dynamics. This is developmentally in our lives the first case of taking turns. And in fact, it may be the only example among animals of primitive turn taking. And what else does it remind you of? It's a primitive conversation. It's the first conversation. Why are humans a linguistic animal? It goes back to the way we breastfeed. Anyway, mother and baby are wrapped up in a dynamic unity. It's not one and another. Mother does not need to guess whether baby has consciousness. Baby doesn't try to decide whether mama is just an automaton. Mother's consciousness is, is the baby's environment, no less than the baby's own experience of the world around. We are always already engaged with other minds. So the paradox, the predicament I mentioned, is a false predicament. But now it raises a very interesting problem. If what I just said is right, then it turns out that mind, consciousness, as a phenomenon, shows up for us only in the context of our relationships, in the context of our intimacy, in the context of our engagement with each other. But, now we say to ourselves, we want to study mind scientifically as natural. But the methods of science are the methods of objectivity, detachment, distance, neutrality. So it might seem that the very conditions that would make the scientific study of mind as a natural phenomenon possible are incompatible with experiencing mind. How can there be a science of mind? This is a deep problem. There is not an easy answer to this problem. But I have a suggestion to make. We actually encounter this very same problem elsewhere in biology. Suppose I'm a scientist studying the behavior of a simple bacterium. Imagine this is a bacterium that lives in a solution and it is, it is such that it moves in the direction of the, the greater concentrations of sugar. We can imagine that there's a direct biochemical linkage between its receptors to sugar and movements of its flagella that move it towards sugar. So in a sense, we can try to look at this bacterium as a little machine. But notice, 
we don't really think of the bacterium as a machine. After all, we implicitly recognize that the bacterium moves towards sugar because it needs sugar to live. It has a reason to move towards the sugar. Not a reason it understands, but Mother Nature understands that reason. When we look at the bacterium, we already recognize that it is a unity in nature. It has purpose and it has structure. It is not merely a piece of the environment interacting according to mechanical processes. And it is only if we see the bacterium in that way as a living unity, distinct from but coupled to, integrated with its environment, that we even identify it as something to study. That we even recognize it as a subject for biological research. But now notice, in the way I described the bacteria, we already have primitive mental ideas of unity, intention, purpose, response, simple kinds of perception. Now, don't be alarmed. I'm not arguing that the bacterium is conscious as we are conscious. But I am suggesting that we have no way of thinking about the bacterium as alive without beginning to bring it into a space that we ourselves occupy as living beings. And this suggests a very fascinating idea, namely that really the problem of consciousness, which is what I've been discussing, is an aspect of a more general, deeper, and more pervasive problem of life itself. A problem which we still do not fully understand, or the solution to which we do not fully understand. Now, in conclusion, I want to very, very briefly, and I know the sun must be very hot for you, and I don't want to, I don't want to tax your patience, but I want to share an idea with you, which I think takes some of what I've been saying and takes it away from philosophy into practical life in a way which is important. There is a social problem, which is the problem of addiction. I imagine that many of you have knowledge of addiction, either in your personal experience or in the experience of loved ones. Addiction is a very serious issue. People die of drug addiction, families are destroyed by drug addiction, relationships are damaged by drug addiction, it burdens society. Very serious problem. And where I live in the United States, but I expect this is also true here, it is a problem that it is almost impossible to discuss in a public context because it is so politicized, it is so moralized, it is medicalized, it is, everything is controversial. And at the moment, at the current time, the, the view of the medical establishment in the United States of America, the standard line about addiction is that addiction is a disease of the brain. Addiction is a disease of the brain. The actual drug abuse or alcohol abuse, the actual behaviors that are so painful and so destructive, the failure in the workplace, the collapsing of social relationships, all of that is symptom of what is in its true nature an underlying neurobiological disorder. Now, there are many people in the community of addiction who are very grateful for this view 
that addiction is a brain disease. Because if addiction is a brain disease, then I'm not an addict, my brain is an addict. And if addiction is a brain disease, then my medical insurance company will pay for the help I need to cope with my addiction. Now I, as I said, believe addiction is a very serious problem, and I'm very compassionate towards addicts. And I support using the society's wealth to aid addictions and treatments. The fact that you support treatment for addicts, that doesn't make it true that addiction is a disease of the brain. And in fact, I think there are some reasons to be skeptical whether addiction should be thought of as a brain disease. And if I'm right, the social commitment to the idea that addiction is a brain disease is very much an expression of this false ideology that I've been criticizing. Well, ask yourself, what, and I'm almost done, I'm almost done. What makes the substance addictive? Could it be an ingredient in the substance? The answer is no. There are not chemical things in common to all the different drugs to which we're addicted. And we're also addicted to things like gambling. Some people are addicted to sex or food. Those have no ingredients. So it is reasonable to ask yourself, perhaps what makes us addicted to the range of things that we're addicted to, an effect that it has on us rather than something in it. And here neuroscience is very, very suggestive. For example, it is now known that if you stick an electrode into the brain of a rat, to a particular region of the brain, and wire that electrode to a lever that it presses, the rat will press that lever forever. It will press that lever and, and give up food. It will forego sex. It will forego rest. It will forego water. Pressing the lever produces a release of dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter that produces pleasure in the rat. And the rat will press that lever forever. It seems that merely putting an electrode in the brain produces addiction. And this is the idea that justifies the idea that addiction is a neurobiological disorder. But it turns out that this very same circuit in the brain, which is called the reward reinforcement circuit, is activated by all pleasures, by all rewarding activities. Stamp collecting, reading the newspaper, it's activated even by activities that are non-addictive. So the activation of that area doesn't yet tell us that there is addiction. There is only addiction when something further happens. And the further thing that happens is the breakdown in the normal interplay of our different dynamic active invest investment in and involvement with the world. What I have been describing is the very essence of consciousness. The addict is someone who actually does look inward. The addict is someone who seeks to change his or her experience not by reaching out and cultivating new skills and new awareness, but by turning inward and playing with his or her own chemistry. What's remarkable then is that really to understand the addict and the problem of addiction, to bring addiction into focus, we need to think about the brain. Yes, the brain is part of the mechanism of addiction. 
but it is only part of the story. We also need to look at the choices and values and larger situation of the addict. And this has a very remarkable upshot. It turns out that the neuroscientist picture of ourselves, you are your brain, an idea which I have argued is a false conception of ourselves, is actually a good picture of the addict self-understanding. It turns out that the neuroscientist has so falsely distorted his conception of our human nature that the closest we come in real life to exhibiting the life of man as contemporary neuroscience understands him is when we are an addict who is turned away from the world and shut ourselves down to, to our real experience, to consciousness. So I say this because what is at stake in this debate about our nature and this project of trying to understand ourselves as natural, although it is philosophical and although it is theoretical, it is not only philosophical, it is not only theoretical. As human beings, we have a stake in this debate and I believe it is time that we take it back from neuroscientists who have actually been doing great harm. And because of the social prestige that attaches to this, it, um, I think it does a broad cultural harm. As we can see when we think about uh, the problem of addiction, but I try to be positive, not merely negative. I try to suggest a positive, a positive idea that we cultivate ourselves and through self-cultivation we achieve an access to the world, a genuine openness to the world, and that is our nature to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.